a backup plan that way. Uh, but I'm going to share the screen that gives the agenda and some reminders, and then we'll jump in. So um, recall, if hopefully you recall, the test corrections for Unit 4 are due tonight. And I've seen most of you have already submitted it. There's just a few that need to submit it. Oh, I think my wife knocked herself out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's a little different here than uh, being at home. So uh, anyway, the corrections are due tonight. Like I said, most of you have already submitted it, but um, if you haven't, then make sure you get that corrected and taken care of. Probably have about 30 minutes to work at the end of the period today. And so um, if you need some help, I'd be glad to help you then as, with that as well. And then if you're going to do a retake today at four is the last chance. I had a few take it Friday, but then we came out to Arizona this weekend. So we spent all day Saturday in the car and yesterday trying to catch up with family. So um, I haven't had a chance to grade those. Hopefully this afternoon I'll do that. But um, if you want to do the retake, you can meet me on Zoom at four today and do that. Um, the positive physics unit five assessment is due after break. It'll be due the night of our next class. And so if you have questions on that, maybe, I know some of you are already done with it, but if you have questions on that, you can uh, talk to me during that work time at the end of the period as well. And then if you plan on doing any review over the break, my top two recommendations would be to work on AP Classroom and the Positive Physics website. In the AP Classroom, we've covered everything from unit one and probably about a, hmm, maybe about a fourth of unit two there's, we've covered almost all the basic concepts, but there's just so many different applications that we haven't had a chance to talk yet. Um, so it's part of unit two, but there's, that's the best way I think to practice multiple choice questions, college board level multiple choice questions. And then there's also just a plethora of daily videos. And they're really good. I mean, um, just hearing something explained from another teacher's perspective and style of teaching you'll pick up on things. I mean, even me watching them, I enjoy learning from other teachers and little strategies on, oh, I've never thought of teaching it that way. Or I've never thought of explaining it that way. Um, so I enjoy watching them uh, just to improve my teaching ability, but uh, they're really good. So I'd encourage you to get on that AP classroom, watch some of those videos, practice some of those multiple choice questions. And then the same for positive physics. Um, little spoiler, I'll tell you more details once I've got confirmation from the administration, but uh, I believe it looks like your exam is actually going to be using the positive physics website. And so um, reviewing on that site will be helping you prepare for the exam as well as just reviewing concepts from what we're doing. And we've covered everything from units one through five already. And then six, seven, eight, and nine are just applications of forces. And like some are on angles, uh, which we're going to start talking about today. Some are on slopes, which we're going to start talking about today. And so we won't have covered everything in units six, seven, eight, and nine, but we will have covered pretty much everything through six and bits and pieces of seven, eight, and nine after today. So those would be good to help you prepare and review if you're gonna do the, any of that over the break. Today, what we're gonna do is uh, I'm gonna go through a couple of questions from worksheet 1B in our unit 5A. So we've got a lot of little uh, subscripts here on our assignments and units here, but and I'm going to do a couple for you as demonstration and then break you into groups and have you work on practicing drawing free body diagrams, which is really, I think, a foundational skill for understanding how to solve problems with forces. And uh, in my morning two classes, I had thought we might take five or 10 minutes of notes after that. But by the time we finished getting through the group work, we only had about a half an hour left. And I'm really committed to making sure you guys have that time. Um, I don't want you to have a huge amount of time required for positive physics over the break. So I've been trying to give you a little bit of time here and there. I wanna to try to give you 30 minutes today again. So we may, we probably won't do those notes. They are just, they were just to review anyway, things we've already covered, but I can use that as a quick review when we start back up after the break to refresh your memory on the things if you don't have a chance to practice on your own over the break. So that's the goal for today. Reminders and uh, worksheet one. Do you have any questions about timelines or deadlines or due dates or anything from those reminders? All right, uh, go ahead and open up worksheet 1B. So you'll find it on Axis in Topics, Unit 5A, 
So go to unit 5A and find worksheet 1B. I feel like we're playing bingo or something. Unit 5A, worksheet 1B. And I'll go ahead and switch my screen to the worksheet so when you find it, you'll know you're looking at the right one. So unit 5A on topics, worksheet 1B. Now this will not be anything you need to submit. I'm not gonna have you turn this in as an assignment. We won't even finish it. Uh, I'm gonna go over questions one and six as demonstrations of two common kinds of scenarios and then have you in four different groups go through two, four, five, and uh, two, three, four, and five. And so we won't even worry about the ones at the end. Once you kind of get the pattern and the practice, um, I mean, the more you do, the better you'll get at it. So you could go on and do the rest for on, on your own if you choose, but I'm not making an assignment and not going to have you turn it in or anything. I just want to get, you know, about a half an hour of practice, making sure you're thinking it through correctly, giving it, a, giving you a chance to explain it verbally. That I think often helps it sink into your understanding. Uh, the best way to learn is to teach. So, all right. So I'm going to go through question one here. Hopefully you found it now. Worksheet 1B. Can I go to my printer to go pick sure. it up? Yeah, if you want to get, if you want to print it, you can. Um, since it's not an assignment to turn in, if you just want to draw it in your notes or scrap paper, whatever, that's fine too. But if you'd like to print it, you can go grab it now. I'll take a quick drink while you're doing that for those that want to do that. Um, I will say for the title, this curriculum calls this the free particle model. And that's not a super common terminology. <laughs> so you won't probably see free particle model in very many books. They also tend to call these diagrams force diagrams, but most textbooks use the term force diagrams to describe something more general. What most books call what we're actually going to practice today is free body diagrams, which is kind of like a combination of things that they use in this curriculum. But if you look in most, including our textbook, if you look in most textbooks, free body diagrams are really what we're drawing. Sometimes a lot of books even abbreviate it FBD. So they call them force diagrams here, but I will be using the phrase free body diagram. And so anytime you see force diagram on this paper, mentally you can substitute free body diagram. Uh, and in the intro, it says, in each of the following situations, represent the object with a particle. And so, like we've talked about in free body diagrams, you're going to start with saying, okay, this is the object we're focusing on, draw it as a dot or a small box. And that's basically what they're saying. Uh, sketch all the forces acting on the object, make, making the length of each vector represent the magnitude of the force. So they're kind of just repeating the four steps that we went over a couple of times last week on how to create free body diagrams. Also use congruency markers to indicate which vectors are equal in magnitude. Um, and so there, looks like I might've lost, there used to be a, there's supposed to be a sentence here. I don't know what happened to it. I wonder if I accidentally deleted it. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. I had it highlighted and must've bumped the delete button. Uh, so you'll be, we'll be talking about these congruency markers to illustrate which ones are equality markers to show which forces or components of forces are balanced. And then it has this little note, except for number six and number 10, assume that delta V is zero. And so if delta V is zero, the velocity is not changing. If the velocity is not changing, there's no acceleration. If there's no acceleration, there's no net force. And that's the sequence of thinking that you're going to hear me repeat, and hopefully you're going to be processing over and over um, throughout the remainder of the semester, basically, as we continue to work with forces. If there's no change in velocity, that means there's no acceleration. If there's no acceleration, there is no net force. So I'm going to go through number six because it is an example where there is a net force and there is a change in velocity. So I want you to see that. But for all the ones you'll be doing in your small groups, they have net force of zero, which means they have no acceleration because the velocity isn't changing. All right, doesn't mean they're at rest, just means the velocity is not changing. It could be at rest or it could be moving at a constant velocity. All right, so for number one, 
Draw a free body diagram for the water skier. Label the force vectors and use equality marks on the vectors. So <clears throat> if we think about the forces of this skier, we need to follow the steps and say, okay, well, the skier becomes the dot. And in fact, we're gonna include the skis themselves as part of the skier since they're attached to the skier's feet. So the skis, the skier's body, that's the dot. And then pulling on the skier would be the tension in the rope that's attached to the boat. So you can see in the free body diagram, there's a, an arrow to the right and it has FTSR. <laughs> and what they're showing there is it's the tension force or the force of tension on the skier by the rope. Now the S and the R that are the last two, these two um, subscripts, I typically don't include those. Some books do, some books don't. There are times when you're solving problems and having those written down can maybe help you avoid confusion. Other times it may just make it more confusing. So um, I wouldn't require you to have those additional subscripts what they're showing is that whole dealer feeler um, pairing that we talked about last week. So they're saying this is the tension force on the skier by the rope. Okay, so they're showing the pair of objects there that are related by that force. I would probably normally just label it FT, the tension force. You can also see that they're representing the weight of the skier. And a lot of students call it gravitational force, which is accurate. And other students call it weight force, which is also accurate there. In this context, they're synonymous. Gravitational force has a broader meaning, but in the context of this problem, I think it would be clear enough to call it that. So we usually, whether you refer to it as weight or the gravitational force, we usually draw it or write it at rather as FG because it is the weight that's due to gravity. And here the SE is, meaning that weight is on the skier by the earth. The earth is what causes that force on the skier of the skier's weight. And then we have the ski in contact with the surface of the water. And the water is providing a normal force up against the skier, but it's at an angle. You can see in the picture how the ski is kind of digging into the water at an angle there. And so we have that upward and leftward angled force They've called it normal force because it is a surface contact. And in a sense, if, if the water is being angled by the ski, you could call it a perpendicular normal force. You could just call it an applied force or you could call it a pushing force. Um, there's nothing really magical in this context of calling it any one thing versus another. If I were drawing it, I probably wouldn't think to call it a normal force because it's angled. I would probably think to call it a push force myself or an applied force myself, but they've chosen normal. And then the S and the W is just on the skier by the water. And remember we're including the skis as part of the skier. Now they said in the overall instructions, except for problems six and 10, we assume there's no changing velocity which doesn't mean the skier is just at rest. It just means the skier is going at a constant velocity. So their speed is not changing and their direction is not changing. Um, that means all the forces vertically have to balance out and all the forces horizontally have to balance out. And just like in projectile motion, we do have to separate the horizontal and vertical. So in the picture, we can see there is a very clear vertical force downward, the gravitational force or the weight force. And we can see there's a very clear tension force horizontally. Then the normal force, what they're calling the normal force of the water pushing against the ski is at an angle. So it has components. It has both a vertical component and a horizontal component. The vertical component would have to balance out, be equal and opposite to the weight force going down. So they've used those congruency markers like two marks and two marks to show this weight force downward and this the component, this vertical component of the normal force are equal and opposite and they cancel each other out. And then horizontally, since this is an angle, it also has a horizontal component and that horizontal component would be the same equal and opposite to the tension force in the forward direction. So there's no horizontal acceleration because those two horizontal forces balance each other. 
There's no vertical acceleration because the two vertical forces balance each other. And therefore there's no overall net acceleration and no overall net force. So we can see that in the picture. And then I like to also put equations down because right now we're thinking about it more qualitatively. Uh, the only quantitative measure is trying to figure out which ones are balancing each other, which ones are equal to each other. But after the break, one of the first things we'll do is start plugging numbers in and, and looking at these more quantitatively. And when we start breaking them down quantitatively, we will want some equations to use. And we can use these e congruency equalities to create equations. So I'm using my own little shorthand here. I'm saying the vertical component of the normal force is equal to the weight force. And then I'm saying over here, the rightward tension force is equal to the horizontal normal force. So just putting it in an equation is also, I think, a helpful skill to practice. So questions about the first uh, problem here, the first example? Uh, yeah, I have one. Sure. Uh, so the lines of congruency um, with the normal force um, and then just gravity, right? Uh -huh. um, does, is that basically just saying that the water skier is not going to sink? Correct. Yeah. There's going to be no vertical acceleration. They're going to have a constant vertical position. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then mathematically, it may be really hard to, to calculate or measure that vertical component of the normal force, but it wouldn't be hard to calculate or measure the weight of the person. And so if we know the weight of the person, we know that vertical component. And if we know the angle, then we can calculate any other side of that using trig. So uh, once we get into the more of the quantitative thought process and sol uh, problem solving, that's why these congruencies being set up as equations are gonna become really powerful. Other questions on this example? All right, I'm gonna skim over the ones that you're gonna be doing and focus in on number six. And then I'll put you in your groups and let you try. So number six, if you recall from the overall directions, it said number six doesn't have a net force of zero. It said that all of them had no change in velocity except for six and 10. So this is number six. It does have a change in velocity. This skier is speeding up. So if we read the statement, it says, draw a free body diagram of the skier who slides with negligible friction. That means you can ignore friction force. In other words, it's so slippery, it's almost as if there's absolutely no friction. Uh, label the force vectors and use equality markers on the vectors. So in this case, we still have the weight of the skier and the skis. We're gonna still assume the skier and the skis are all one object. And so that dot represents the skier and the skis and the ski poles like all as one dot. But the skier with his skis and ski poles or her skis and ski poles would have a weight. And that would be straight down to the center of the earth. Now the normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. So, one thing that you can do with free body diagrams when the surface is angled is what they're illustrating here in this free body diagram. Instead of keeping the X and the Y in the normal, truly vertical and truly horizontal position that we usually do, they're just angling it to match the slope of the hill. Now the value of that in this problem is almost nothing. There's, there's not really much advantage in this example. Um, but um, when, you, when we talk about number five later, whichever group ends up getting that one and, and explains it, in number five, by angling the axes to match the slope of the surface, it, it'll make you have fewer vectors with components. More of them will match the axis if you rotate it. And so that's really the advantage in certain problems. For this problem, there's only two forces. So one of them will be on the axis and one of them won't. <laughs> and it doesn't really matter. If, if, you had draw, if we had drawn the X and Y normally, like just straight up and down, the weight force would be on the Y axis and the normal force would have components. 
And then if you angle the axis like they've done here, it puts the normal force on the y axis and the weight force has components. So you're going to have one with components and one without either way for this problem. So there's not much of an advantage, but I wanted you to see one where because the, the ground or the surface is sloped, you can slope your axes as well. So for like indicating parallel lines, um, does it have to be like two lines for like the vertical component? To show whether they're congruent or not, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, uh, no, that's just you. I think for this curriculum, they tend to use two, um, but you could use one, two, three. It isn't, okay. there's no uh, fixed pattern. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, the skier is going to be sliding down the hill at an angle, but not relative to the ground. They're not going to be burrowing into the ground and they're not going to be flying into the air. So vertically, there has to be a cancellation of forces. So that perpendicular normal force, because remember, normal force has to be perpendicular to the surface. It has to be being balanced by something. And it would be being balanced by the Y component of the weight, by the Y component of the gravitational force. And because the skier is accelerating down the hill, there has to be some force component pulling the skier down the hill so that they accelerate. And that would be the X component of the weight. So the skier's actual weight is pulling them down the hill because of the force of gravity. But there is no other backward horizontal force or X component force. So that's why we know the skier would be accelerating. Now let's say maybe the slope was not so steep and maybe the skis, the, like the surface was much rougher and the skier was moving, but not actually speeding up. They were just going down the hill, but at a constant rate. If that were the case, then there would have to be some friction or drag force back along the X axis. And so if the problem were a little bit different and they'd said the skier wasn't accelerating, but actually there was friction or there was drag, then you would have a backward force along the X axis. And that's where shifting the angle of the axis would mean the normal would be on the Y, the friction and drag would be on the X and the weight would be the only one that has components. If you flipped it back and had that third friction force on there, the normal would have components, the friction would have components, and only the weight force wouldn't. So it's not wrong to do it one way or the other, but one way you have one force with components, the other way you would have two forces with components and more trig to work out. So it's more of a matter of trying to help you uh, make the problem simpler. So whenever the ground is shifted uh, at an angle, it's probably advantageous to just shift your axes to match it. All right, questions on number six. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and put you into breakout groups. We'll be in four groups. Um, if you are group one, you'll be doing problem two since we already did one. If you're in group two, you'll do problem three. Group three does problem four. Group four does problem five. So just doing the problem that is one higher, uh, the number that's one higher than the uh, group number that you're in. So any questions at all before I send you off to work? Okay, when you come back, you'll explain the problem. You can use the whiteboard uh, you, to draw it if you want. If you want to draw something and take a picture and show it, um, something that's easily visible, because this is obviously something they'll need to see, not just hear described to understand it well. So off you go. All right, I believe we're all back in the main room now. Um, let's have group one talk us through question two. And just a quick comment as they're prepping, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen or whatever you're gonna do. Um, if you make mistakes, we're just gonna correct them together. This is just a learning process here. So uh, don't worry about that. Uh, I expect to still be teaching a lot through this if necessary. So take it away.
Um, all right, I'm supposed to be explaining this problem, but like the entire screen just froze for like the past 20 seconds. So do I start explaining now or like, um, wait. Someone's drawing, I don't know who's drawing, but. I believe that's Frank. Okay. Uh, or... Yeah, it is. Yeah, you can go okay. ahead and tell um, us about the well, problem. And start so I guess. So there's a, there's a sled that's being pulled and there are four different forces that are being applied on it. And um, so first there's a force of weight, which goes straight down uh, and it's like gravity, the one that's like, uh, like pointing straight down. And then there's a normal force that's like pushing it straight up that kind of balances out, but there's also an applied force. And I, Sorry, I'm very bad at explaining this because I barely have any idea what's going on either. But um, like uh, the force of gravity balances out with the vertical component of the applied force and the normal force. And friction balances out with like the horizontal component of the applied force. That's kind of all I have for this. All right, so you've got the weight force going down and the normal force going up. You've got the friction to the left. You've got the applied force to the right, but at an angle, right? So the, what I would say is um, the FHA on this picture isn't really a force. It's just a component of that angle. So there's, there's really only four forces. It's just that that angled force can be broken down into two parts. So there, um, I would probably leave off that fifth arrow straight to the right. Does that make sense? If you're just um, having it as part of your axis, that's okay. But I wouldn't label that as a separate force. Okay, so is, is this okay? Yeah. If, well, if can this, I erase the whole thing? Like it, uh, sorry, just go ahead. That's fine. Yes. Is this okay? Okay. That yeah, that would be just the forces with no axis on it. Uh -huh. But how do I show that this pulling action has a horizontal force? So uh, what I what I would do is like draw dotted lines to show like this angle has a dotted line down and a dotted line over because you're just going to turn it into a triangle like we did with displacement and velocity where this what this angle is your hypotenuse and then you've got a yeah you've got a vertical and then you've got a horizontal makes sense makes sense yeah and then the friction would be congruent with the horizontal component right yeah this and this yes yeah those two would be congruent Does that making sense yeah that makes sense for me okay good now let me go ahead and show mine um there's an equation i want to show you on my version of it just to talk through the relationship so let's see your number two so here we go um so you can see mine, it all, actually mine shows the axes with dotted lines, but you can see it's just basically what you had. And just like I, should, what, like I mentioned, this friction force backward horizontally would be congruent with the component, the horizontal component of this tension force. But I put these equations over here, and I think these are good for us to try to process mathematically what's going on. So that friction force is equal to the horizontal component of the tension. So I'm just using my own little subscript formatting here. The horizontal tension is equal to the friction force. Those would be congruent. The weight force is downward and it's the only downward force. So it has to be balanced by all of the upward forces. And there's two upward forces. Well, there's one upward force and then one that has an upward component. So that downward weight force would be the sum or equal to the sum of the normal force, which is upward, and also the vertical component of the tension. So those two would have to add up to be the weight. 
So I think sometimes drawing the picture when you have an angled force like this, Sometimes you have to think about how things balance as more of an equation like that. So vertically, horizontally, it's not too hard. It's just that one equals that one. But vertically, the downward gravity is equal to the sum of those other two upward forces. So any questions about number two? Um, I, I have a question, but I'm not sure you explained it. Uh, already, but for the net force equals to zero, can you give us example where the net force doesn't equal to zero? Equals yeah, so, something else. How, how yeah. would you change this question? Oh, this in this question? Yeah. Um, if I change this question to say um, that the sled was at rest and then the person accelerated it forward. Oh, okay, okay, I see. So then then the tension force would have to be bigger so that that horizontal component's longer than the friction force. Okay, so show it, it is accelerating from zero to a certain speed, but in this diagram, it's a constant speed, no acceleration. That's why the net force is zero, okay. Yes, yep. Okay, good. Makes sense, thank you. Yeah. All right, let's have group two talk about number three. I'll stop sharing my screen. All right, I'll get the screen share working. Can you guys see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, all right, so uh, the guy pushing on the table. So first there's just, you know, the gravity of the table uh, because of the table. And then there's the force applied by the guy's hand, which is uh, this red part right here. And um, that's at an angle because he's pushing at an angle. And then there's the friction uh, of the table because uh, it's the sideways um, thing. And uh, the distance, the, the friction, the distance of the arrow is equal to the like distance right here. So this is equal to that. And then um, the normal force uh, going up is equal to the force of gravity. And the, oh wait, I was supposed to share with my team. Uh, team, you do the rest of it, my bad. Um, I can finish how the normal force is the um, sum of the vertical component of the um, force applied and the force of gravity. Um, yeah. Good, I like the color coordination here, showing the different forces of different colors. Let me go ahead and show the equation, how I set up the equation. Your diagram is just like mine, so uh, there's no, no issues there, but the equation I have may help kind of process that relationship that Jilly mentioned. Uh, and Carter started too as well. So um, the table itself has weight, so that's the FG. The normal force, if like try to imagine if you were the floor, okay? You're the floor and at first, the table's just laying on you. So all you have to care about is the table laying on you. But now this dude starts leaning on you. The table feels heavier, right? It's like pushing harder on you because now he's leaning. So if you're the floor, you've got to push back enough to support not just the table, but also however much this guy is leaning down. So if I think about my equations, horizontally, like Carter said, that friction force so that the table isn't sliding when the person leans against it has to balance the horizontal part of the dancer's lean, right? But the floor, the normal force that the floor is providing has to take care of the weight of the table plus the vertical part of this person leaning. It's kind of like the opposite of the sled. This person's pulling, like if you were the ground underneath the sled, if the person wasn't pulling, you would feel all the sled and both kids. But as soon as the person starts pulling, because they're pulling up a little bit, if you're the ground, the sled feels lighter now, right? Because now the person's pulling up a little bit on you. So you have to think about the vertical versus the horizontal and adding up the ones that go in the same direction. Questions on number three? Now you feel sorry for the ground. 
All right, let's go to group three with question four. Oh, I gotta stop showing my screen, sorry. Hello. So we had the problem of the person hanging off the rope. And so since there isn't like a surface that he's on, there's not gonna be any normal force. And so um, he's gonna be hanging down. So that's only gonna be um, affected by gravity. So that's the vector going down. And then, um, and then the tension from the rope, um, the tension will be coming from the same um, angle at which the rope is being pushed, like pulled down by the guy's uh, weight and gravity. And so those are the um, two vectors that are pointing outwards from the object, from the point. Someone talk about some the congruency ideas here. Um, so I can, I was trying to figure okay. out how to unmute, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, the, the horizontal forces of the tension will cancel out and then the two, uh, vertical forces for the tension will, uh, equal the force of gravity. Yeah. And I see you guys have that equation down below that leftward vertical tension and the rightward vertical tension would add up to the weight. Um, yeah, looks good. So you guys have the diagram, you got the congruency and you got the equation as well. I don't need to show you mine because you already actually did the equation. So good. Any questions about this one? All right. Yeah. Like I said, no reason to show you mine on that. So last group, number five, the squirrel problem, infamous squirrel problem. Which of us is like, do you have a picture of it, Gavin, or do you want? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if my picture is 100%, but I think we could probably make it work. Um, okay, so the thing with this one is that uh, the plane that we're on is actually slanted. Um, so what that changes is, is it means that gravity has um, a uh, like an x and a y component in this problem. So um, aside from the normal force, which counteracts the the y um, component of the gravity, because obviously there's no acceleration because the squirrel's um, standing still, um, there's now an x component to gravity. Um, and so that gets counteracted by the friction that go, is going up the slope. Um, I'm not sure if the graph is 100%, but uh, that's the general idea of how the forces are going against each other. Yeah, good. So you've got, you've got all the correct forces, the downward weight, the, the upward normal that's perpendicular to the roof, and then the friction that is parallel to the roof. Um, I, I would... Since you angled your axes, I would probably put the components on the gravity one instead of the normal one. Okay. Um, but what, the way you described it was exactly right. Um, I'll go ahead and show you mine for the equation this time, uh, kind of like the others. So we'll just share this real quick. So just like he showed, it's also a little easier with the dotted dashed lines to see what's the axis and what the forces are sometimes. But um, so just like they showed the normal forces there, gravity there, friction along the roof. And just like Gavin explained that friction force is balanced by this X component um, of the gravity because gravity is pulling the squirrel down, but because relative to the roof, there's two components uh, of gravity. One is, pushing the squirrel against the roof and one is trying to get the squirrel to slide down the roof. If you've ever stood on a roof or a sloped surface, you know, if you didn't have friction, you would slide. Well, apparently there must be friction here to keep the squirrel because it says it's sitting still. And so that vertical component of the weight of the squirrel 
is congruent to the normal force and the horizontal component of the weight of the squirrel is congruent to the friction that must exist to keep the squirrel from slipping. So no, no like combination of forces, they're just straight up equal to each other in terms of the vertical being equal to normal and the horizontal being equal to friction. All right, questions on that one? All right, so drawing free body diagrams and thinking them through is, is a skill that takes time to, to get good at. And some people generally do that pretty rapidly. Some of you might already today feel, okay, I've got it. And others of you may feel like, okay, I don't think I really have this down bad yet. And that's okay. Um, when we come back from break, we'll be doing a lot more. This is something that we need to practice a lot to get good at. And we'll also then start to put some numbers on it. And sometimes for people that are more mathematically inclined, those numbers really start to help too. So, uh, but that's what we'll be doing right after break. Between now and then, uh, don't forget to upload your test for unit or unit four test corrections. And don't forget to show up at four o'clock if you're gonna do a retake. And uh, don't forget to be working on the positive physics unit five assessment. Um, the assessment part, not the work part. So make sure you're doing that. And I didn't give you quite as much time. It took a little longer to get through some of those uh, group discussions, which is okay. I'd rather you understand it well, but the little bit of time we have 17 minutes left. If you wanna hang around and ask questions or get help from me, I'm more than happy to help you out. I'll keep the Zoom running. Um, but if you don't have any questions, you can be dismissed. And I hope you have a marvelous Thanksgiving. Thank you. Have a nice break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.